Good evening, everybody. Um, I don't remember seeing you at 3 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> so how do you know I was there? <laughs> anyway, um, start with my usual acknowledgement. My uh, Anna Christine could not join us and uh, still doesn't quite understand why if I'm awake, I'm usually working. So, but anyway, that's the way it goes. So I set a personal trajectory and I'm going to weave into the story um, my connections with Anisur Rahman, Anis as we all call him. And I've used slides I've, from other talks and one in particular is, is this one I gave a few years ago. I think Michele also gave a talk at this institution. And, uh, enabled me to dig back to more timely memories. So here's the first slide I want to put up. I, I think this is an incredible, unfortunately not high resolution photograph of a niece, as I knew a niece and probably Michele too. Is that fair? There was always a smile on his face and he had a great sense of humor. If you go to the American Physical Society or you go simply to Google, you'll get the information on the left. And what I hope to do, at least initially in the talk, is uh, elaborate on the real man. So to me, the overriding thing, he was so humble and uh, gracious and charming. And the attribute he had, which is very rare, he would sit down with anybody and share with anybody his codes and everything. And a slight side story here. In the early days, we would have difficulty running trajectories long enough to transform time correlation functions. So Ian MacDonald and I took him aside and said, show us how you did this. And, and the truth was interesting. He would plot them out. He would use a pencil and smooth them. Then he would type the codes back from the smooth curve. And that's why all his curves were beautiful and ours were ugly. So machine learning, that was real intelligence, not artificial intelligence. Anyway, history. Anise must have come from a wealthy family. This is a photograph of the family home in Hyderabad. And according to Jaddy, when we met her 10 years ago, she said that uh, Anise's father actually donated the land for part of, what is it, Osmanian University in Hyderabad. And uh, so that's an image of the, the family home. So here's, here's a photograph of Anise, 1941. So I was one year old. So, uh, and obviously bright person. He was sent to Cambridge as an undergraduate, but I, he may have already had a degree before he went. And uh, the photograph on the right is, is incredible. He's the family photograph of him arriving home, having hitchhiked from Cambridge, England. So those of you interested in committers might want to imagine that trajectory from Cambridge, England to Hyderabad with a thumb. So I think that will be an interesting adventure to do that. So here's a photograph of Anise in Genoa about to get on a boat. And um, to go back to his, I guess, his first job and other photographs that were given to me from the book that his wife wrote, but shared with me by uh, his daughter. So there's a photograph of them getting married and a photograph of the daughter when she was, I think, 10 years old. Uh, yesterday, Bala sent me a copy of a paper in Nature on the Indian drums, and we all heard this concert. I thought it interesting to point out that one of Anise's first publications was a variational method for vibrations of Indian drums. Uh, you might want to try and download. I couldn't succeed in downloading it, but uh, maybe when I get home to my home institution. Um, and then there are many, many papers since then. But if you go back historically, um, C. V. Raman was interested in drums. I noticed this, this paper in Physical Review 
So it was quite acceptable to publish in Fizz Rev the modes of the drums you were hearing. Just as a hundred years ago, that's all. So this was the paper that uh, Bala shared about the vibrations of drums. And th there are even earlier papers by C.V. Raman on string instruments. So those of you that want to go searching the web might enjoy reading them. I, it's a rather bad image. That's the best I could do, taking snapshots just recently. So a hundred years ago, that was very, very topical. So the first citation to work by Anise that I came up with, and th this, these are slides from 2007, so they're probably still valid. It was the 17th meeting of the Indian Academy of Sciences, and the following speakers appeared. And one of them was Anisur Rahman. And I think what he spoke on was later published in Acta Crystallographica. It was about some integrals involved in structures. Um, but there's another character on here that I published a couple of papers with uh, here, Chandra Sekharan. Uh, the sabbatical I spent in France in 1975, I published two papers with him. He was still around, um, but had a faculty job at the University of Paris. I'm not going to go on. So I, I don't have the time to go into this trajectory of Anise, but he did wander around India for a bit, trying to find a job. And in the end, uh, two-body problem, wife being a biologist and him, they ended up at Argonne National Lab in the US where she was in the biology division and he was in the physics division. And that they did for 25 years until he got sick. And in an attempt to save him, he moved to University of Minnesota. So here's some other photographs from that time. This, uh, the 1960s were very productive, as we know, the famous paper is there. Might say a little bit more about that in a minute. And Anise was somewhat of a celebrity because of that work and uh, started visiting CCAM uh, in the 1970s. So my, my interactions with Anise follow this trajectory. Of, of course, I noticed his paper in Physical Review but in my mind, I was working on solids at low temperature and I wasn't interested in liquids at high temperature. So that information was stored in a different part of my brain. And then giving a seminar at the University of Maryland in their Chemical Physics Institute, after my talk, Bob Swansea challenged me by saying, why are you wasting your time summing these Feynman diagrams and evaluating them on a computer? You can just use molecular dynamics. So we had a spirited argument because, in fact, I was interested in low temperatures and then molecular dynamics wasn't so useful. But if you were interested in high temperatures, then, then it could be. So that was sort of latent in my brain. I first met Anise at a workshop at CCAM on molten salts and a subset of us formed into two groups to try and implement dipole-dipole polarization in simple sodium chloride. And another group used the shell model familiar to solid state physicists. And uh, the results of that workshop came out a couple of years later. Anise was there the whole time. I, I was only there for half of the, the time. Then I met Anise at the Liquids Gordon Conference and then Conference on Orientational Disorder in Crystals. We just heard from Yashana that that was exactly the time when you were doing your calculations, and so Anise would have been familiar. But he was also sick at that point. At that 84 conference, I remember discussing with him his, his illness. So I recently gave a talk at a memorial service for Lou Vallée, and my task was to talk about the 1970s. And as I said, to talk about the 1970s, you have to understand the 1960s. And to understand the 1960s, you have to understand the 1950s. And I've got a disclaimer there that what you're going to hear is um, my views and not the views of my university, OK? Just to be clear, I live, everybody above me in the university is a lawyer. So <laughs> you witnessed that I did say that, right? Okay, so 
the, the, the full talk was, is already online of, of this period, but I do want to go through it quickly. If you want to know about the prehistory of computers, the new edition of the Frankel Smith book has come out. I advise you to buy it or look at it at the very least, and you'll see about well described the, the, the early years. I do want to give a shout out to the first paper. Um, what I grew up known, knowing as the Metropolis method. In, in fact, we know that that's incorrect, that it's really Ariana Rosenbluth's method. But if you want to find out more about that, there's a talk by Michel Marichal and also a beautiful interview, Don Frankel, you'll find on the, either on YouTube or but through CCAM. You'll find very interesting. There, there is no doubt in my mind that molecular dynamics, as, as we know it, is really origin in, in Bernie Alder. So, and that was in the 1950s. So, 1960s, if, if we move on, um, 1960s was a difficult time in Paris. I don't know if any of you were there at that time. Um, there, there were riots in the street and something to do with the French politics of the time. But the United States was not much better during that period. Um, the, the events in Paris followed incredible trajectory in the US, the Cuban Missile Crisis, assassination of Martin, uh, John F. Kennedy, the riots which I experienced peripherally because I was at Rutgers Physics Department, summer of 64 and summer of 66. And finally, when I moved in 67 from UK, from Bristol University and arrived in New York, I couldn't reach the Rutgers campus because the state troopers were occupying all the streets into the town because New Brunswick, New Jersey was on fire and burning. Um, we survived in the US till November the 7th, 1968, at which point I departed for Canada. Um, the alternative was my draft card, which was A1 for Vietnam. Um, it was an exciting time. And again, I have another talk already online describing the, the impact. That th this was a period of in immense creativity, despite the turmoil, uh, both in science and in the arts. So focusing on, on the science as a prelude, 1960 was, I was entering my final year as an undergraduate, and it was the custom to do um, a project, shouldn't really call it a thesis, an undergraduate thesis, it was really a project. And I was assigned a bunch of papers to read and try and figure out if I could calculate the solvation energy of ions with a reasonable model. And the first paper I was asked to read was the banal Fowler paper on water. And if you haven't read it, I would advise people to read it because this, this model has pervaded everything we do to the present time. So the model was very simple. They, they understood there were van der Waals forces. They understood there were short range repulsions. They also understood you had to do the electrostatics and how did they figure that out? They went to a very elementary electronic structure and that was what informed their model. And they even argued that the dipole moment of the molecule has to be enhanced compared with the gas phase because of many body effects. And that is all in that paper, volume one, 1933 Journal of Chemical Physics. So the next 50 years was really optimizing that model. So 1962, I published my first paper. Uh, hard to imagine it so many years ago, but I was interested in lattice dynamics of crystals at low temperature and elementary excitations. And uh, it, it was, we've lost the microphone. Can, it's okay? All right. Um, yeah, the excitement for me was that my thesis advisor was on another continent. And there was no internet. And so we corresponded by mail. And that's how I got a paper in my first year as a graduate student. 
So any graduate students in the room advise you to make sure your advisor goes on sabbatical. So he was very kind to me, my advisor. He sent me to an international conference in Copenhagen. And there I saw the first molecular dynamics calculation. And it was a movie that was shown by George Vineyard, who ended up being the director of Brookhaven National Lab. And he was interested in radiation damage. And he integrated the equations of motion by what we call the Verlet algorithm, before Verlet, many years before Verlet, and um, published papers, and very impressive because they were interested in channeling of energetic particles through a solid. So that was one of the exciting things. The other exciting things is that Bert Brockhaus was there announcing his first measurements of phonons and magnons, excitation, collective excitations of solids. So it was a very exciting meeting. So there's a picture of me. I was already married, and, and uh, my wife was going off to work the summer. She, she worked for a cosmic ray group, and she was working in Germany, and uh, came with me to Copenhagen, and then I went off to the school. And I love to tell this story. At, at that school, um, I met and, and talked with Max Born and Peter Debye. So I don't know if there's anybody else in the room that managed to talk to Max Born. Uh, so I may be the last link. But anyway, so I already told a couple of people here. I saw him sitting outside the lecture, and not inside when I, I came out. And I went over to him and asked him if he was OK. He said he was fine. And I said, he would, as, what else do you say? I said, are you enjoying the meeting? And he said, uh, I think I've heard it all before. But they've changed the notation. So that was my conversation with Max Born. So um, there was also a summer school attached to the conference, and Peter Debay gave lectures there. And it was very interesting to talk to him because I, I wanted to know from him, I, I suppose I was a strange graduate student, I wanted to know from him what it was like to have lots of effects named after you. <laughs> Do you remember all the pieces of work that you did? And he looked at me very strange, and he said, it's the density of discovery that matters, and I've been going a long time. <laughs> so anyway, that was that. And then at the end of my thesis, uh, I'd already submitted my thesis. I went to a summer school in Chalk River, Ontario, the nuclear lab there, many body theory. And two of the lecturers, one was Walter Cohn, and the other one was David Thaulis. And David Thaulis looked about 10 years old. It doesn't, doesn't look much different there, but... Um, and Walter Cohn lectured on honeberg cohn theory. So I think I was a very lucky graduate student to, to have gone through that experience. The big take-home for me from those meetings was the discovery of S of K and Omega and G of R and T. Just the notion that this paper by Van Hover um, to me, it was very beautiful, and that informed my own personal research uh, to try and how, how could we understand that and model it for real systems. So that's a bit of a detour, and uh, let's move on and get back to Anise and molecular dynamics, because, as I said, the year I got my thesis and was at the Chalk River meeting is when this, this, this paper came out after the meeting. Uh, October 64, I was already on my way to Genoa to be a postdoc and showed up there at the beginning of October. So we were well aware of the paper. It caused a lot of excitement. But again, I was focused in that era on, on solids rather than liquids in my own research. Oops. Uh, Anise, um, in, the, in the meeting we'll, we'll, we'll talk about in the MD at 20, after, after the dinner, told the story that soon after the paper, he went and gave a lecture at the Kuran Institute. I think it was the Kuran, or it may have been Yeshiva. Um, probably Yeshiva. 
And in, in the audience, uh, Perkis was there and stood up and asked Verlet, uh, asked Anis whether he knew he was doing microcanonical simulation. To, to which Anise said he replied, I am. He had no idea. So that generated this paper. Lou Verlet went on sabbatical in 1966-67 in that group, Leibowitz, and uh, they sat down to rationalize the fluctuations in various ensembles. And it's an interesting paper. Uh, Verlet, while he was there, coded up on the same computer, I think, that Anise had used at Argonne National Lab. So not physically the same, but the same model and uh, wrote this paper. And he gives acknowledgement to the earlier work of Anise and also Bernie Alder, of course, and, and the Monte Carlo. This is a highly cited paper. Um, so so you, you may wonder why was it so important three years after Anise's paper? And, and the issue is it was done by somebody at a university and not in the national lab. And also it was done with the, more systematically, I would say. But the, just the fact that anybody in principle at a university could do a similar thing. Uh, at the same period in the UK, Monte Carlo methods were taking off with Ian MacDonald went and joined Conrad Singer and started to reproduce some of the same data that was done by MD, which was a good cross-validation, but much more important, Ian introduced the MPT ensemble um, a couple of years later. It's, it's a paper that's mostly ignored. It, it is a massively important contribution. Um, all of the work that Bill Jorgensen did subsequently depended on this, and it, it, it's just not, Ian is no longer with us, unfortunately, but th this was a phenomenally useful piece of work. The, um, the Verlet had a whole series of papers, but he, he had a student, Jean-Pierre Hansen, that was interested in quantum simulations. He used Jastrow functions, variational Monte Carlo, and was interested in the properties of low temperature solids and, and also more classical things. And um, that's exactly what I was doing using different toolbox at the same time. Um, publishing in decent journals, what we used to call quantum lattice dynamics. And uh, we, we were very lucky that a guy called Krumhansel, who became later president of the American Physical Society, introduced the two of us. And on my drive from New Jersey up to Canada, I stopped off at Cornell and met Jean-Pierre in 1970. But after I landed in Canada, I discovered John Barker was there. I'd overlapped with John Barker when I was doing my PhD. He spent a sabbatical in the UK and was <coughs> working on the theory of liquids. But my interaction with him was more about coding up integrals on the primitive computers we had. When I was a graduate student, he taught me how to change the order of integration and so on. Very, very clever guy. Never had a PhD. And... Uh, John arrived in Canada about the same time as me, but we, we got together. But he, he gave me a preprint of his paper with Bob Watts. And this is the first simulation of, of, of a molecular liquid. Uh, the model wasn't particularly good, but it, was, it had a very good pedigree. It was from John Rowlandson, fit to gas phase data and so on. But they, they, they were the first. And this, this connection with John inspired me to move into molecular systems. So let's, let's move on. So John only survived one winter in Canada and moved to IBM in California, San Jose. And the first thing he did was invite me to visit. And being the, being the nature of the winter in, in Ottawa, often getting five meters of snow, it, it didn't take me long to accept to go for January, February, March in, and visit him. And that enabled me to collaborate with Bill Hoover. Also, I collaborated with John Barker and wrote quite a few papers using molecular dynamics. And in particular, I was interested in testing these anharmonic theories of lattice dynamics, testing them against the 
the Monte Carlo, which of course was what Swansea told me to do many years earlier. So that, that was a very, very productive visit for me, having access to machines and so on. Uh, back, back in Orsay at that time, they continued doing their work. As I said, I met Jean-Pierre at the Quantum Crystals. I met him in 70 and we agreed to work together. He said uh, he didn't want me to visit him in 1971 because he was getting married. I mean, we did. There was no urgency in those days. <laughs> So we put off, uh, but, but then he, we did meet in Banff in Canada, the Quantum Crystals Conference in September 71. And I went to Paris annually to work with the, these people in the University of Paris South, as it was called. Um, and there's a picture of me with my two kids and one of the, one of the nephews, um, 1976 in, in Paris. So I, I spent, probably more time in Paris than I did in Ottawa during those, that period. What I want to stress here is that our, our approach at that time, most of the physicists were interested in using the simulation to test their theories. And I was much more driven by trying to make contact with experiment. I, and I, I want to stress that. That, that was my goal. And most of my collaborators didn't want to go to anything more complicated than atoms. And, and I really wanted to, to go to molecules. Um, this, this paper came out um, roughly the same time as my Monte Carlo stuff came out. But it was, it was a bit of a surprise that this came out. The, the model was a peculiar model that Frank Stillinger had worked out on the back of an envelope to try and maintain tetrahedral structure. And it, and it, it was very effective. Um, it, it's well cited, but not massively cited. Um, as I said, I, I did my work, but it was John Barker that, that inspired me to get into the field of molecules. The biggest problem was finding a computer to use. And I was very lucky that in, in, the, in that era, there was no security at nuclear labs. So on a Friday afternoon, I drove 100 kilometers or 120 kilometers north of Ottawa into the wilderness and entered the nuclear lab, the Canadian nuclear labs, as everybody was coming out for the holiday weekend. And I was going in. There was no security. I went straight into the computer, downloaded whatever was there, put my box of cards in, and I had the computer for the weekend. And that's how I uh, was able to do Monte Carlo calculations. In. If only it was so easy today, right? to go into Los Alamos. <laughs> anyway, it, even so, it, um, they, they were intensive calculations for the hardware. I, I'm going to give a shout out to Dominic Levesque for this because I, I think this was the first decent MD of a molecule. Decent meaning I'm sure the temperature was correct. <laughs> I'm sure the, everything else was correct. And uh, again, not cited very much. The, the model was a bit crude, but it was the first. But that, that inspired me to, to work with people in that group further. Uh, Dom Levesque went on holiday in, uh, in John Velo's group in Toronto while his wife worked at the Chalk River Nuclear Lab. And so I got to see him when he transitioned from one location to the other. The, the path went through Ottawa. So I, during that period, I got to see him. 72, I did spend a lot of time in the Valet group, working with Jean-Pierre. And interestingly, neither Jean-Pierre nor I had done molecular dynamics at that point. We were both Monte Carlo people. Uh, even variational Monte Carlo with, with JASTRO functions. We, but we didn't collaborate on that. We, we, we did molecular dynamics and, as I said, driven by S of K and Omega was the driving force. Um, but I had in my own group doing their own thing, people working on molecules. The second water paper, which is more highly cited, where they improved what they did, is 1974. It's the same era I'm talking about. So our first MD paper is in the Journal de Physique, in the letters section. And the reason it our paper to Physical Review, a uh, Journal of Chemical Physics, I think it was, 
No, physical review, because we had tried physical review letters, and that got rejected. We wrote a bigger paper, that got rejected. So young people, don't give up. Don't give up. So we used the Journal de Physique letters, and what it meant, we had to write an abstract in French, which wasn't too tough for somebody from Luxembourg and me, and it got published. So that period corresponded, I would say, with a lessening of interest of what was going on in the group by Lou Vallée. And it also corresponded to the time when CCAM was growing in importance. Importance in the sense that more and more people were visiting CCAM, and it became more of a deep attractor than the Vallée group, which at that time was quite focused on trying to model helium. And so anybody interested in more complicated things was, was showing up at, at CCAM. And uh, also CCAM had a machine, so that also was an attractor for coming there, given the, the difficulty in the early 70s to get on machines. I met Ian McDonald for the first time, well, I met him at lunch, but actually to work with him, I joined this group, Yakuchi, McDonald and Raman, in the workshop 74. Uh, was Giovanni, were you there at that time? You must have been, yeah, yeah, because of Yakuchi era. I stayed for only one month of the six weeks, and I developed an inner ear infection. I couldn't stand vertically for more than a couple of hours. And uh, I went away and I told them to take my name off the paper. I regret that now. Otherwise, I would have had a paper with a niece. But I didn't really contribute very much other than setting up how the group works. Uh, one group on shell model, one on dipole induced dipole. I, I did work on SFK and Omega with Jean Jacques uh, over a number of years. Um, it was, it was a, a really good adventure with him. Very quiet, understated, but very solid scientist. As I said, the, the Valet group sort of somewhat imploded. It still exists, but it's very, very tiny. And uh, so its role in disseminating molecular dynamics disappeared, as I said, with this dissemination of computers around the world. It was less important that you actually showed up at a place with a computer. And uh, as I said, this is a quote from Jackie Kennedy. I think that Camelot era of the high energy and theoretical physics group in Orsay just uh, dissipated. There was a legacy publications came out. I have a paper with Bernie Alder from that era. Um, if for some reason in those days, we were never in a hurry to publish. Would you agree? I mean, why was that? <laughs> we wanted to make sure it was correct. <laughs> and I, 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 it's hard to explain the, the, this, this drive to publish a paper, a paper, a paper, a paper. And we, we were very relaxed in those days about... Maybe we were arrogant, thought we never had any competitors. I, I, I don't know what the reason was, but anyway. Uh, that's the era of this phenomenally important piece of work. Unfortunately, Herman's not with us anymore. Um, and we, we have people here. This transformed the ability to simulate macromolecules. And I didn't actually say it, but it might have been implicit that we used equations of motion and we made sure we were dealing mostly with rigid molecules. And in fact, our codes used quaternions to avoid singularities in the equations of motion. So th th this was transformational for, for the field. And rightly, it's massively cited. So if you understand shake, it, it turns out um, you, you need to get instructions from Italians on how to use your hands. <laughs> See? <laughs> <laughs> That's just the way it is. Anyway, there's a video where you can learn the sign language. I encourage you to take a look. Okay, 1977. What was Michele doing? We were working. 
<laughs> Cayley was, well, uh, he, he was actually at a summer school in Corsica. It's, it's one that I didn't go to, and it was, a, it was a very important for the field. Uh, Ian MacDonald was there. I remember he lectured on transport. I only know because I knew Ian. I don't remember why I didn't go. Were you in that? No. Um, it, it was a, an important event. It got Ian his job in Cambridge. I, I think Sam Edwards was at the meeting who heard Ian lecture. Something like that, anyway. So let's move on to the 80s. The 80s uh, were massively important. We, we had the focus more on algorithms, I would say, expanding the range of what we could do. And uh, the, these were transformative years. And uh, I put a few names down there. The fi obviously Feynman, John LaWallace, Bruce Byrne. Um, Bruce made wonderful contributions there. We, we have Carl Perinello, and then we had Nose's work, and so on. Um, Michele already gave a shout out for Hans, and I think uh, in incredibly uh, important contribution. The extended Lagrangian was born, massively cited, and this is what Michele was doing in 1980. Um, it's, it's amazing what depths you go to to use a computer, right, Michele? <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I mean, he was in Argonne Lab. Was that in the lab? No. Not in the lab. Okay. No photographs allowed in the lab. So, what was this one? <laughs> he was auditioning to get in the Guinness Book of Records as the tallest Italian. No, but seriously, it's not true. <laughs> no, I, I made fun of it. I shouldn't. Michele was seriously ill and, and, uh, at that period. But somehow, but this photograph distorts the perspective in a way it makes you look two meters tall at least, if not more, right? Um, okay, but joking aside, this was immensely productive time for Michele, very important paper. This one less cited than the follow-up in applied physics, which has 17,000 citations, a new molecular dynamics method, which generalized to variable box, uh, what Hans Andersen had, had done for isotropic dilations. And uh, th th this is, um, I want to go back to this slide because the Gordon Conference on Liquid in August 1980, I, a lot of us gather outside when people all arrive before the meeting starts, and these come running across the field waving a, a, a paper, waving, waving, waving. Mike, Mike, you, you, you've got to do this. So he was showing me the, the paper they just submitted to PRO. You've got to do this for molecules. And as I've said many times before, if it had been easy, he would have already done it. It, it took us two years, and, but, uh, but we did it. And that, fortunately, I had Shuichi Noze in my group, and we had a FizRev letter in 1983, still before you joined the group, right? And uh, this was an exciting time for us because we were able to do molecules, but the graphics at that time was not anywhere near competent enough. So it was a major issue to display the results. And Suichi was phenomenal in my group. And that enabled us to make sure that the Monte Carlo MPT was agreeing with our MD code, which we were confident was correct, and that led to this paper with Bill Jorgensen. So in effect, this paper had finally optimized the Bernal-Fowler model from 50 years before. And Suichi did other things. Uh, he encouraged him to write a pedagogical article, which he did. And uh, 
Then he did some incredible work on his own just before he left to go back to Japan on the new ensembles. And that brings me on to the path integrals, which uh, a lot of us dabbled in and, and still use, and Mark worked on that in, in my group a, bit, a little bit later. But these were the early days when Mikhail Sprick and uh, Michaeli and Anise did their solvated electron. And a few weeks later, I, we modeled meonium in water using the same toolbox, basically. That brings me to MD at 20, and it's taken me quite a while to get here, but I'm going to flash through this. So th this is the cast of characters that, having found out that Anise was seriously ill, decided to honor him, the 20th birthday. And this is the picture that is, is shown many times. I'm going to blow it up. And there's pretty well everybody that was anybody at that time. I put a ring around Michele. Michele was doing his best to hide. But we, we can just see his mustache, which uh, is the giveaway. And there are other people in that uh, picture, which is fun to identify. You, you can see Giovanni in the front row here, right? Giovanni's here, David Chandler's there, unfortunately not with us anymore, and other people, many of these people are not with us. Hans Anderson's there in the front row. Now there's Michele, and there's Don, Don Franco, and uh, many, many others. Peter Roski's here in the front. So I blew up some of these pictures. Uh, Priya Vashishta's on the right, Frank Sillinger, Michele, and we've got Uzi Lamman was there, Herman Bernson, uh, Conrad Singer, anybody was anybody was, was there. There were two Nobel laureates there. They weren't yet Nobel laureates. And uh, John Polanyi and John Popel. There's a John Popel and then John Polanyi. You've got uh, somebody that Shrikant will recognize. So he was there. Every, everybody. David Seppel, was there, and again, you've got down, down at the bottom. Sid Nagel was there. There's Bruce Byrne, Jean-Paul, Ian MacDonald, and so on. So it was a, it was a great event. Charles Bennett there, I've, I've highlighted. And uh, I, I gave the after-dinner speech, and I, uh, I read a poem. It's embarrassing. I'm not going to read it again now, but I did read that poem. And uh, when I got home... Um, I had left it there. So I, I did have a PC in my house at that time, and I typed it, and I couldn't find it when I got back home. So I, I wrote to Anise and asked him if he had it. But this is what happened after the, after the speech. I already mentioned that earlier. He said he gave, gave a lecture on his simulations. At, here he says it's NYU. And uh, this has led to the Perkis paper. You'll notice in my shirt there, I'm carrying punch cards. So in those days, we never had internet. So we would scribble notes on the back of the punch card and put a stamp on it and post them. That was our internet. And I'm going to prove to you, as ridiculous as that sounds, here. So Anise was ill. And... Uh, Okay, if you can read that, with my pluvitis leg and bedridden state of existence, I decided to write to express my appreciation and thanks for the meeting. The poem I will greatly treasure, very sincerely. And he, he just says, Dr. Mike Klein, Sussex Drive, but it found me. So I suspect the Canadian Secret Service were following me because... <laughs> It doesn't say National Research Council. It doesn't even give a number. Anyway, I worked for the government, so mail came in folders on my desk in the morning. See the punch card? Received at NRC. That's the time and date. And on the back of the card, this is the note from Anise. Okay? That is really how we communicate. I should try to find that card. It should go in a museum. <laughs> um, and that's the photograph before the meeting. We were having a drink. You've got Herman Berenson, Conrad Singer's chopped off. There's Anise, there's me, and there's Ian MacDonald. And uh, 
Can any of you read that? Is that correct? The Urdu? What is? So I would just say, is that correct? Okay. So I think, and the date on that is November, or maybe that's, you know, he's put the date, November 14th, 1984. Okay, the next big event, and I see I don't have a lot of time left, so we had this fantastic meeting that Giovanni orchestrated, uh, where Michele was supposed to talk about the usual stuff, but instead he introduced this incredible new algorithm. We'll say a little bit about that. Um, and this snapshot, which many of you may have seen, but we have two of these people here uh, at the front row in, in the Verena School. I say a little bit about moving on, and this incredibly important paper from many respects, um, psychologically as much as anything, as well as physically. Because again, at the beginning, finding a machine was one of the challenges, right, Michele? To find hardware. Yeah, I mean, so, but, but very important psychologically, and of course, ma many of us use quantum espresso, and Stefano Baroni is acknowledged in the, uh, in the, in the paper. So I, I want to give a shout out because, uh, uh, unfortunately, Anise passed away soon after that, and uh, I asked Joe, Joe Hauptman, who was probably Anise's last student, uh, and, th and this is what he said. The most impressive thing that struck me about our niece was the way he dealt with his illness. He was kind, considerate, and maintained his sense of humor. Uh, but professionally, just his behavior. He said, uh, soon after I met him, I went to discuss something in a lecture. I was expecting a confrontational discussion. But he said, well, suppose what you say is right. And, and then we worked it out. So, this is what I used when I gave the talk in Calcutta in 2007. I just re recycled that. So, you know, Anise was special. Um, I, so Joe left science, and he's, he's a professional artist. And there's a picture of him with the president. So I, he was a postdoc with me, and he phoned up one day and said, Mike, I can't come to work today. I've got to buy a suit. Why do you need a suit, Joe? usually in jeans. I'm going to meet the president. The president of what? No, the president. And so he, he won the competition, which is an annual competition, to do a painting that goes on a stamp for hunters that hunt on federal land. And that was 1992. And uh, looking through my files, I found some of his transparencies. Remember, this is pre. So in my group, he was working on self-assemble monolayers, gold coated with layers of long chain molecules. And I found some transparencies of him introducing a talk. So he's studying long chain molecules grafted onto a gold surface. He says, it's a can of worms, right? And what's the difference between MD and MC? Anyway, this is again a relic from when Joe I, maybe I can put them up for auction at some point because his paintings go for four or five figures. Um, that's, that's the painting that won him the first competition. He's won it many times since. His, that's what he looks like today. And he, he is the man for painting ducks and, and other animals. OK, so I'm going to go a bit faster here. Um, for those of us that use ab initio MD in various forms. We, and even if we're using machine learning, what, what you get is no better than your input. And so it's very important for the, the quantum chemistry to be as good as it can be. And uh, my, he's no longer my colleague, but he was. It's astonishing to me that this paper, if you, if you Google five minutes later, the number of citations has changed. So it's probably 200,000 now to just this one paper. Uh, so this, of course, made him, so I'm going to speed through. 
I think this was a seminal event, Michele. The gathering of the clan in Messina. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. I think there was uh, uh, when uh, we got uh, it was also water cone and that. Yes, so water cone is unfortunately missing. I don't know why. You, you, your honorary degree. I, it was an incredible gathering, and uh, I don't know why Walter's not there. Your brother's there, right? And Jenny's there, but I don't know what happened to Walter. He, he was definitely there. And then we had my birthday in Sicily. I, I do like that, that photograph. And um, soon after that meeting, Michele wrote a paper, which I call the beginning of a quiet revolution. This paper came out 2007, and somehow it was stealth for a bit, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the machine learning technologies were not uh, what they are now. No. Yeah, it was not the same as what they are now. It did take a while to ramp up, but uh, still a massively important paper. Um, the, the field got a Nobel Prize, but for the, the dark side of the field, I would say, uh, if I can, since I participate in that side and been funded for that side. Um, that's another lecture. But the interesting thing is that Michael Levitt wrote to me and asked if I could send him a copy of a picture of Anise for his lecture, his Nobel lecture. And Benoit was complaining, you don't find pictures of Anise. And so... Uh, I sent him this cropped out of the picture from 1984 of Venice, and this is the slide he used in his lecture. So. Then we move on to MD at 50, was 2014. We were very fortunate to have Jaddy here. She looked remarkably well. It was astonishing that she passed away <laughs> like days later, right? It was terrible, really. She, we had a wonderful time here. They, this photograph was shown already. The beautiful article here by uh, Professor Sen is not here, but of course Shrikant is. Um, these pictures at the dinner we had, and, and she looked re remarkably well in this. A nice photograph of Dom with Shrikant and Jaddy. It was fabulous to have her here. and. Uh, can't say more than that, and we had, we had a really good time with her. And unfortunately she passed, and uh, this, this is from the website that was created. And that's the grandson, and uh, Kalidas Sen post, posted a, sh a shot of Jaddy. So I'm almost done. Um, as I said, there was a quiet revolution, but it really accelerated and a whole new generation has, has come around to us and, and that's pretty much all I have time for because it says I've already expired. So again, I uh, can't say enough about friendship with Anise. Actually when he was dying I was calling him every other day in the hospital and, uh, in 1987 I, I remember well. I had another friend dying of cancer at the same time in Canada. It, was, it wasn't so pleasant to have to deal with it, but it, it, was, it was fun to talk to him. I must say Jaddy was very good through all that. So just a couple of quick pictures. There's a picture that Joe Houtman, the artist I told you about, sent me this picture and said, I had a digital twin. Apparently. These days, everybody has to have a digital twin. Do you have one, Mark? You don't have a digital twin? Oh, well, Michele does. <laughs> we, we all have to have a digital twin, guys. All right, that's it. I'm done.
I think we all need a drink. So did I break the rule, 140 slides? It took me all day to go from 195 to 140. <laughs> all right. Okay, we're done. Oh, you, we, we're not done. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Okay. I'll get that in a minute. Thank you. Go, go, go. And our thanks to the chairman.